I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge, and I want to welcome you, Lisa, for being here today. This is the Committee on Social Services, Veterans, Cultural, and Recreation. And to my right is City Councilor Gina Louise Shira from Ward 4. And to my left is City Councilor Lisa Klein from Ward 7. And I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6. So I'm calling this meeting to order, and I'm also announcing the audio video recording of this meeting. And also, I would like an approval of the minutes of April 22nd, 2015. Alyssa, do you have the minutes? I don't have them. Would you like a couple of minutes to look at it? Thank you. You're welcome. by Gordon Thorne, who was one of the owners of Thorne's Market, and it was established on the third floor of Thorne's Market, um, and it's a 501c3 nonprofit corporation dedicated to, um, to the arts. So um, uh, I was um, part of APE in, from about 1970. 77 to 1980. So I was a member of the dance company that was affiliated with APE on the top floor of Lord's Market. And that's how I originally got connected to APE. Um, so the um, physical space of APE occupied uh, a certain portion of the third floor of Lord's Market, um, about 10,000 square feet, and it was dedicated to um, studios and um, art gallery and a performance space, <coughs> rehearsal and performance space. And it <coughs> remained so until um, 2006 when the Thorn Brothers sold the building. Um, at that time, um, <coughs> I was um, appointed, um, I, I actually left the area for about 18 years and I came back to Northampton in 1996. And in 1997, um, I became the associate director of APE. Um, so that's short for available to the president. Um, so in effect, I, I became the kind of managing director, the day-to-day -day manager of APE. Um, and in the 2006, when the building was sold, we remained in the building for one more year. And during that time, um, Gordon, um, looked for another space for AP to move to, um, and he found a building that we're currently um, occupying, which is at 126 Main Street, a few doors down from Florence oh, next to Michelson's Gallery. So oh, he oh, bought the, the, that, that building with the proceeds from Florence Market and, um, and then established APE in that building. Um, we occupy roughly two and a half floors, um, the main 
uh, street level floor, which you see as you walk by, and the big with the big picture windows, is our main public space, and that is primarily used for visual arts and art installations. Though we do often have readings and um, other events there, we have some performance there as well, but um, primarily it's for visual arts. Um, we have offices on the second floor, and we have storage on the floor, which is below. Um, the mission of APE is to provide space, um, affordable space for contemporary artists to make work, to show work, um, to perform work. And it has remained so since its inception. Um, we primarily serve the local community or the local and regional community. Um, and we provide space for those artists to, to do work, show work in the, in the space. Um, we have an application process um, where artists have to prepare a proposal with images or with examples of work. And then we review those proposals and we make our schedule um, based on the proposals that we accept. So there is, um, there is a submission process. Um, we are interested in serving not only experienced and seasoned artists, but we are very much interested in serving younger emerging artists as well. And we make sure that we, we, we provide space during the year for those emerging artists to have a place. Um, over the years, over particularly since 2006, there has been a loss of affordable space for artists in Northampton. Um, probably you are aware of that, um, in that that top floor of floors went away. And um, subsequently in 2013, the Northampton Center for the Arts, which was in the old South Street building, school building, closed its doors. And so they, they lost their home. So they were the other organization that became, was a community-oriented arts organization. And so, um, uh, and also the Pleasant Street Theater, as you know, closed. So um, their APE has been at the forefront of a, of a move or an initiative to um, replace what has been lost. And since 2006, um, uh, there, there was a consortium that was formed, which included APE, the Center for the Arts, Northampton Center for the Arts, the Northampton Arts Council, the Young at Heart Chorus, and New Century Theater, the primary organizations, that formed this consortium to search for a new building, a new space, a new collection of spaces to replace what had, um, what had been lost. Um, a lot of the reason these spaces were lost is because the real estate market has become so appreciated in Northampton and there is literally no affordable space for artists to rehearse, perform, have studios. They've all gone out to other towns now um, because downtown has become very expensive. So in addition to the programs that APE does at its own space, which is very important, we have been very involved in um, in this, in this initiative um, to help <coughs> try to find a new home for the Center for the Arts, to help replace the performance space that we had on the third floor, um, and to provide other um, working spaces for artists in downtown. Uh, to that end, the consortium um, formed the Northampton Community Arts Trust in 2010. It was incorporated as a 501c3. APE is represented on the board of the Arts Trust, as is the Center for the Arts, New Century Theater, Arts Council, and Young Heart, um, as well as other, other um, community members. Um, we, uh, we, we searched through about four different buildings, um, including the bank, where Urban Outfitters is, the uh, rap, uh, Roundhouse, um, the uh, First Churches, the Catholic Church on Holly Street, and then Union Station before we found the building that we now own and occupy at 33 Holly Street, former 
lumber yard and university gym. Um, we have received three rounds of Massachusetts Cultural Facilities Funds grants, two feasibility study grants, and now a capital grant, which is going to help us towards renovating that building. So um, that's not, you know, to say that AP hasn't done other things, but we're very involved in this project as well as having our own programs. Um, so I wanted to point that out that that is a, a very, um, you know, that's a very important part of what we're interested in currently is, is, is to try to make this project a successful project for the community and to make sure that um, we re replace some of the space that has been lost. And that's, that's related directly to the AP mission, which is to provide affordable space for artists and community. Otherwise, they're all going to leave. <laughs> so, um, APE is also involved in several other arts um, projects and initiatives around town. Um, I sit on the steering committee for Arts Night Out, which is the monthly art walk, um, along with Penny Burke and some other folks, and we um, have helped bring that to, uh, to fruition and to, I think, quite a great success. Um, and um, it's ongoing, and, um, and so we, you know, we, we meet monthly, we develop the brochures, we try to bring members in, we work with the business community, so that's a very um, important project. Um, I am also on the steering committee, um, again, also with, with Penny Burke and some other um, arts leaders in the town of Historic Northampton has just started a contemporary art program. And um, I was, I am, on, I am part, APE is a part of that um, steering committee to develop, again, with the idea that Historic Northampton, um, you know, is, is on the brink. I mean, it's a, it's a very well-respected institution, but they have very few resources. And they came to us to try to see if we could find a way to partner and to bring some life downtown. And so we developed a program in one of their galleries at the far end of the museum. We have a monthly contemporary art program where contemporary artists can apply to um, show their work there. And, and the requirement is that they utilize some aspect of the museum's collection in developing their proposals. And that's also been extremely successful. We're now, I think, in our second or probably second full year of, um, of uh, projects there. Um, and then uh, AP has also uh, been instrumental in developing another project called the Art Salon, which is a for forum for in which artists can present their work in a slideshow, in a PowerPoint presentation, and we move around to different cities in the valley. So I'm also on the steering committee for that. Lisa, I see that you're an associate director and treasurer. Is that a lot? Um, I'm an associate director of APE, and um, yeah, it's it's a, it's naturally not a lot because APE has, you know, has, it's not like we're doing a million things at once. We have one show up per month, and so the financial financials are fairly straightforward. Um, we do receive operating support from the Massachusetts. Cultural Council. We've had that for years. Um, and we have a number of fiscal projects. That's another really important part of what APE does in that we provide our 501c3 status to individual artists, to art groups who do not have their nonprofit status but want to apply for funding. So, for instance, um, there's a woman named Denise Baudet who, who is, has a project called Invisible Earth, just a portrait of Francis Crow. And she um, is working with um, a project around social justice and the importance of rooster resistance. I'm sorry, it used to be called rooster resistance. Yeah, rooster resistance. Um, we and and we're uh, her fiscal sponsor. So um, and we have um, the dance generators, um, you know, theater. Um, yeah, or just a number of different of different artists. Yeah. We can sponsor because we can provide that 501c3 um, 
Sullivan status, but things like with the DA Sullivan, who was the DA Sullivan school, ever since everybody had to move out of there. You mean the South Street School? Yes. And it was like artists trying to find a home. It was so difficult. I mean, look at Penny Book up in Barnes Grammar School. I mean, the well, that was another building we looked at, actually. Yeah, <laughs> but the price tag was pretty big, and a lot of work had to be done there. Well, a lot of work had to be done to Holly Street. But is there a time frame for that, or and the time frame you know, is um, we the the the. the the building was purchased in October of 2013, and then it was it, we had it open for interim use while we were, we were developing the plans. Um, we now are pretty confident we're going to start construction in the late summer, and um, we hope that the, um, the the first phase of the renovation, which will be to secure the building, to put new new insulation and new roof get the building very secure and to get it up to a place where we can have a certificate of occupancy will be hopefully nine months to a year. And then um, the last phase of that of that um, construction or of that project will be to develop and build out the black box theater in the building. But first we have to, you know, we have to get the building secure, we have to make it affordable, we have to make it, you know, tight. So it's really an envelope, and it can be um, affordable to operate. And then we have to build out the interior spaces so that they are functional, and then um, we can bring the building back up to the public. So we have our work cut out for us. Did you hear about the grant that? I'm we have not heard from NEA yet, but we we should be hearing in June. I have my fingers crossed. I'm not getting my hopes up. I know it's a very competitive grant. We have received a beverage foundation grant. And we've applied for a community foundation grant, which we should hear about very soon. And we begin, we have begun the capital campaign. We're in the soft phase of the capital campaign, uh, identifying, forming our campaign committee, and um, identifying how to identify lead donors. What's it going to cost you for the renovations that you're um, Well, we're working with DA Sullivan, actually. Um, and we're working on the numbers now, probably between 4.5 and 5. But it's 25,000 square feet. Yeah. It's a building that hopefully will take us into the future. And hopefully if we do it right, it will. And you're talking about fundraising also? Yep. Fundraising. So I think the fundraising will, will go probably about three years. Sorry. Um, each of these entities that uh, make up the Arts Trust, so each of them has their own challenges, I would imagine, with fundraising for them as individual organizations. But then you come together and you're trying to do this capital campaign and you tell me how how do you make sure that you're not kind of competitive in um, that's a good question. Um, we 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 come together to to say that this is a building that, that those different entities can use. So uh, the idea is that there will be a primary tenant in the building, and that primary tenant is the one organization that doesn't have a home, which is the Center for the Arts. Now, they are the most community-based arts organization in Northampton, so, um, but that said, you know, they physically occupy the building and they're the primary operators or operational managers, um, it, it still means that the other entities can come in and use space there. And maybe it may be that New Century Theater will one day be the resident theater company there. Um, but we, um, I think we all felt like, like we, we would make a more fortified, we would be more successful if we came to the community as a fortified group of people who really care about what happens to, you know, the arts in Northampton, instead of just one group or, the, you know, so then thus the coming together. But no, we, we um, you know, we talked a lot about the, that, and I think that we all have a sort of agreed that the fundraising is really going to be to make this building happen so that the rest, that all these organizations can use it. And APE doesn't have, um, 
you know, AP has a home. There, you know, we have a home, but we 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 lost our performance space. We have a number of affiliate artists who would like to use a performance space. So um, we're very invested in this project um, because it also just really follows our mission. How we many want square feet do we have right here? Um, well, our main gallery space is about 2,000 square feet. You mentioned that you have two and a half floors. What what happens on the other? So the uh, there are five floors in the building. The ground floor is just a garage and storage. The floor, the mezzanine floor, which is below the street level floor, is now we rent it out to. Um, it, it's a sort of an open office area, and we rent it out to um, currently to local landscape and um, website designers. Mm -hmm. We have a, a nice collective that rents it out, and we have some of our storage in there as well. Um, the second floor of the building, it, Gordon has a library there, and he has an, an office there. I have an office there. There's a conference room where we have meetings. And then on the top floor, um, is he has a studio, and his wife has a studio. She works with children and does, um, does work, artistic work with children. Is it a conference space that's used by all the different arts organizations? We, we're we very generous with it. I mean, we allow other arts organizations to use it if they want. We have a lot of meetings there. We have a lot of our um, you know, project meetings there for different things. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't rent it out, really. So organizations from around town could come to you and ask if it could be used for if, meetings? If, if it could be used on a one-time basis, maybe. I, it's too hard to commit to letting someone use it on a regular basis because we don't know when our meetings are going to be. So. Do you get a lot of booking? Um, well, our our space is our gallery is is pretty much scheduled out nine months to a year in advance. Yeah, we have a lot of demand, and it changes monthly. It changes pretty much monthly. Yeah. Um, right now we have a month of performance, so we have three different projects in there. But mostly the, the visual arts shows run anywhere from two weeks to a month. Was there any discussion at any point of making it a performance arts-based space or using one of the other floors to create a stage for dance and other... You know, there was, never, there was never really enough room on any of the floors to really do that. And I think that the feeling was um, amongst the, the consortium was that Northampton has never had a um, independent black box theater that could seat 150 to 200 people, never. And so um, it was felt that um, we really need to find that in this community. We really need to do that. Because we have, okay, we have all these music venues. They're prohibitively expensive to use. Um, then there's the colleges, but they're impossible to get a hold of. So where is a small independent theater company going to perform here? There's nowhere. And it used to be that they could go to the Center for the Arts or they could go to the top floor of Thorns, but all, both of those spaces are gone. And in the new building, I think we've done a smart thing. We have a, a, a flexible performance space on the, street, on the street level, which could be uh, you know, rented out for private events if we wanted to make money. But it will hold 100 people. So if someone wants to have a smallish performance, we'll need up to 100 people. And it will have flexible seating. And then we have the black box, which occupies a much bigger space in the building, which is going to have probably the capacity for 200 seats. So it's, then we have both. It's, and it's really, that's really nice that we can do that in this building. Um, and the black box space will be a true black box theater, and um, and you know, I think it will be yeah, so in demand. I, I you know, and then you know we want it to have the capacity to show film. Um, there's a huge group of film people in Northampton who don't want to go to Emerson. They want to be here. So we have um, we have plans for you know making sure that we incorporate that into the program as well. It's a tall order. But um, it's, it's very exciting because I think um, even though artists are going out to other communities to find apartments and studios which are more affordable, many artists still want to perform, they still want to show work in Northampton. Mm -hmm. It's still very desirable for them to do that. A lot of them are going to East Stanton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
But East Hampton doesn't really have a black box theater either. No, no. So it, it's, a, it's something that I think if we want to call ourselves an important arts town, we need to have. I know it's kind of the state of the arts around the country. In the United States, there's a climate of struggling arts um, endeavors. But I'm wondering, it just sounds like each of these organizations struggles, I think, financially. And um, nonetheless, you've come together to take on this incredible project on Holly Street. And I'm wondering if, um, if it feels manageable, and if it feels manageable to the individual organizations well, I think the, yes, I, I mean, I think the idea is that we, the, the trust's job, which is separate from the organizations, the trust job is to purchase the building, to renovate the building enough so that it's usable, and to take away those capital costs so there'll be no debt on the building when those arts organizations move in. And that building is going to be so energy efficient that it's not going to cost a lot. We're planning to put, we have a donor who's making a gift of photovoltaic array on the, on, the, on the roof. And that alone could wipe away you know, three quarters of the electric cost. So the idea is, okay, it's going to be a big push up front, but we're going to, we want to make a building that doesn't have debt attached to it. So that the arts organizations aren't pressured to make a lot of money, they can't make a lot of money. You know, pay, they'll pay their operating costs, but they're not going to be carrying a mortgage. That is that is the goal. That's a big goal. Because it's like, it's like it's like if someone <laughs> what? Clear with an optimist you are. Well, we we hope that there'll be enough momentum. Well, no, it's wonderful. I mean, that's the kind of vision you need to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you and know. The same with Penny. I mean, Penny works so hard too. She's Dinner, it's like I've been the hearing arts, it for such a long time about the struggle. The Center for the Arts has 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 put away a significant amount of funds towards a new building for themselves, mm -hmm. and that was through the hard work of Penny and First Night and all the things that she did. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, nobody understands better than she uh, or me how hard it is to, you know make a profit. You don't want to make a profit, you just want to make your your expenses. And you also don't want to charge the artist too much. So, you know. It's very difficult because once there was cheap space in Northampton and that does not exist anymore. That's what everybody said. So how do you return that to a community that's already appreciated so much? How do you really do that? So that's what we're trying to do. And if we can do that, then we'll protect that space and we'll not be, we'll take it out of the market economy. It'll be its own thing and it will never appreciate. It'll just be there. So we we don't know if we'll be successful, but we hope so. And um, we hope that we can be a model for other communities. There are a couple of other communities who are trying to do the same thing. There's a, a something called the Community Arts Sustainable Trust in San Francisco that's trying to do the very same thing we are. Of course, they, they're in the middle of a big city and they have some significant funding. They're doing the same thing. They're buying a property and protecting it and then leasing it to arts organizations for reasonable amounts of money. And so, if we, you know, if we can do that, it's going to, I think, be very beneficial to the community. The, will be a model and you know I think down the road it would be great to think that there might be buildings that would come up for sale or might be donated to the trust or could we imagine having affordable space for artists in this town affordable live work space hmm. yeah <laughs> I don't know yeah. how about um, Eric Short he ever got in contact with no. artists on the city? I can't believe that. No. He's not been at all interested. It is interesting. Yeah. Huh. So, um, but we have a we have a very dedicated group of people we're working with. Um, reach some amazing goals. I mean, 
Yeah. 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 We, we now we own a building that has right. no debt on it. Right. Which is mm-hmm. purchased outright by donations and gifts. That's right on Holly Street. When you had that open house, that was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And Ward 3 has been really supportive. Um, and we're excited to be in that part of town. Not only that, there are a hundred parking spaces. Do you know how valuable that is in this town? Uh-huh. That alone <laughs> is worth a lot of money. Parking. But, but that end of town, I think, is, is I mean, we're very excited to be there. It's a part of town that is um, a lot of walkability, there's a lot of room for growth, um, there's excitement. It's so it's five minute walk to main you know main street, the main intersection of the town. It's we could not have asked for a better location in the way. Yeah, location is perfect. So we have a lot of good things going on. Right? Amtrak right there. <laughs> um, so, but I you know Gordon Thorne who is the director of ATD, he's been he's been instrumental in this. He's been instrumental in, in what he's done for this town. How many board members of the Arts Trust or APE? Um, ten. Most of them are artists. Um, most of them have been in this community a long time. We're trying to we're trying to get some younger, new, younger members. And you have meetings what, once a month or so? Um, we, our meetings at APE are only about quarterly, but our Arts Trust, the Arts Trust Board has about 10 people and we meet once a month. We have a lot on our plate. <laughs> so what's the next function coming up? Uh, for APE, uh, we have uh, three nights of dance concerts this week, and then next week we have two nights where we're, we're doing some contemporary dance in our space, which is always a little tricky because the floor is, it's not a sprung floor, it's mm-hmm. a concrete floor with marmolium over it, so the dancers don't love it, but yeah, um, they adjust. So um, there's a very vibrant dance community now in this valley. A lot of the people who graduated from Smith and Napoleon uh, wants to stay in the area. There's a, a number of faculty who who want to perform outside colleges and you know um, there's a woman named Jen Pollins who started a contemporary dance company in school and she was working over Holly Street for while it was open so uh, there's a you know, there's, there's a lot of um, excitement about that what type of dancing do you think um, it's modern contemporary modern, modern. Dancing. Then we have um, visual art shows all summer, June, July, and August. Now you're open, what, six days a week? Uh, when we have a visual arts show, we are open six days a week. Um, right now, we'll, we're closed except for the performance day. Okay, so it's not, nobody can just go there. No, not this week and not next week. But after that. <laughs> and you have a website? We have a website. Mm-hmm. So it's a- apeartf.org. We have a Facebook page. You know, probably another suggestion too is that City Council, we have the open public session, come in. Anything that you think that, you know, the public should know. You should come and get in front of the microphone and say, this is what's happening, these are the dates. Well, maybe when we move a little bit further along with the renovation, we'll do that for the Arts Trust Building. Okay. Especially if we have the NBA grant. We have to partner with the city. That would be very important. We will be making a very big fuss about that. <laughs> is there a good place for people to sort of keep um, up on how things are moving along. I feel like I get people asking me a lot, like, what's going on? Where are they with the renovations? Um, you know, have, the Orx Trust has a website. Okay. Um, I don't know how often Richard is updating that with updates. Um, there's a Facebook page, too. But Richard Wagner is the president of the program. And if you send him an email through the 
website, you would definitely get that. Okay. I mean, right now, we're still doing a lot of things behind the scenes because we're still making some big decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe you should get it on just camp. It's on all the time. Yeah. And recording everything. <laughs> we're working on um, our campaign materials. And uh, Richard is a videographer. So he's making some really great videos and um, interviewing people in the community. Peter Blachette, and then he's got some great stuff. So that's going to be up on the website. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anything else you want to ask you? Thank you so much. And, you know, of course, when we, we'll probably, once we hear from the Community Foundation, should we get the Enneagram, I'm sure we're going to do a big press release and that will be publicized. But, and also when we start construction, I'm sure there'll be some, something we can work out that. But still, <laughs> we're working away on the, on the details, okay? Please note Very too nice that you. the members of this committee, I'm sure, and the whole city council is, I mean, we would like to support this work. And yeah. so we've talked to Penny, she's been here a member of the yeah. committee here and mentioned that. Well, I mean, we, we, we should, yeah. We, we've always asked, you know, how can, what are right. the concrete ways we can help you? And I, if there are, please, you know, let us know. And, and this committee can be the first place that you come to and we can kind of. And make sure we're on any list of, you know, to be invited to come to, you know, we maybe, would love to be supportive just with our presence as yeah, well. Maybe um, uh, if you want to write down your emails for me, I can take them to Richard and make sure you're on the list so you can get updates. We're on the city website. On the yeah. city website, okay. okay. Yeah. And this community, committee is called the Social Services Veterans Culture okay. and Recreation. SSVCR. <laughs> Think of a ship, SF, and the picture yes. of the old way of watching videos, DCR, and you've got that. Just roll up. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will make sure, and we also, we want a, the city to be as involved as possible. You know, if not, if not financially, then in other ways. So, yeah. How old is that building, anyways, on Holly Street? Well, it was, a, it was a, the Rug Lumber Storage Company. I don't, don't, don't know when it was built. Probably in the... 30s or 40s? Really? I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't know. No, maybe later than that. It's more like 60s. Maybe, maybe it was yeah. 70s. It's in somewhere in the literature. I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unless I have your contact information from all the reports oh, yes. we did. Thank you for all your support, too, yeah. for the grant stuff. I wish I could have done more. No, but you know. Okay, thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Okay. Um, she's really good. Can you announce the audio video? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> We were just here talking about Ward 3. I know, we have to get out of here for 6 o'clock because they have ordinance tonight. Lisa Thompson was our guest just now and she talked to Paul about how wonderful it is to be in Ward 3 and what a great, great board it is. Very nice. Right. Are we ready for Brian, do you think ordinance is in Ryan, what's at 5? I thought ordinance was at 5. It's at 6. Six right on there. You scared me. You're right. That's how diligent you are. What's the word you used? <laughs> Negligent? <laughs> Have a great meeting. Bye. So, anyways, what I'd like to do is because we have to be out of here for the ordinance committee is to move up of what I'll speak about for the agenda for the month of June. And for the month of June, I have the Young at Hearts coming in, I have the assistant manager coming in, and I have Bo Flayhive, and I think she's bringing a couple of students from North End High School, and she's so happy about being asked to come. So, and I told her this was all new to me with arts and so forth, so thank you for really helping out. You get them to speak to <coughs> Do you have a set up? Are you going to show a screen presentation? Oh, good. Uh, I was planning on doing it, but um, 
Pam said she was coming over to help you. What time was she coming? I'm scheduled at five. Yeah. Was, was Pam coming at five or sooner? She should be on the way. Do we have anything else on the agenda? They're part of your presentation. You yeah, do I think visual? I can start talking to you about. You know, do you want me in this chair? Yeah. A little bit far back here. Yeah. Yeah. You have to lower the light. Shit! Put that yeah, spotlight on. The interrogation. I can know, right? Um, okay. We try to intimidate our guests as much as we can. That's Introduce Al Williams. He's the executive director from NCTV, and I just need to introduce the city councilors. To my right is city councilor Gina Louise Shearer from Ward Four, and to my left is Alyssa Klein, councilor from Ward Seven. I'm city councilor Marianne Labarge. And Al, you're going to do a screen presentation. I know that for a fact because you're down on the agenda and I talked to you about that. Sure. And questions and answers. So why yeah. don't you go ahead and start? Sure. Um, so um, you may have varying degrees of familiarity with what we do at Northampton Community Television, but we are the community media center for the city of Northampton. Um, about eight years ago, um, the community media center, which previously was run by Comcast, who is the cable provider along in, in Northampton, was transferred to independent nonprofit um, control under Northampton Community Television. So our name didn't really change, um, but the um, expert here. Okay. Hi. Hi. Expert. <laughs> um, okay. How are you? Good. Are you Al? I am Al. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm good. We've never formally met. I, I don't but we that. have communicated over the phone and yes. our agenda <coughs> was set up so he wasn't able to hook up without you. Okay. Um, do you need a computer? Yeah, just a projector actually hook up if you have one. Yeah, I actually already have it set up for you. You do, great. Um, Is that this over here? Yeah. Yes. Inside the um, the desk drawer where you're sitting uh, is the remote. Is there audio as well? Uh, there should be. Uh, well, no. You're going to be able to have audio through your. Um, I don't need audio just for showing. This is a little bit banged up, actually. I'm not sure. I'm definitely. It's a little banged up. It's a little the the pins are a little bit. Okay. So we're pretty excited to see what you're going to be doing over in City Council Chamber since. It looks very yeah. nice in the in the hearing room up on the second floor. Oh yes. really? Oh, is it done up in the hearing room? Um, I yeah, why don't you guys want there for the uh, the mayor presented his budget? The Chinese. Yeah, you have a new screen in there, and they. Uh, why wouldn't I? Uh, well, it was one of those last meeting of the month. Budget, I mean, our finance committee meetings last Tuesday of the month. So hey. Yeah, I know. So it didn't happen during the council meeting. Right. The little purple there probably means my connection's off in the real Oh, there we go. I got it. So, totally, oh, yeah. Are you going to be able to control it on your mouse, or do you want? Oh no, I can control it. Yeah, okay. it's actually just I'm just using a web browser. Everyone see okay? 
Um, so as I was saying, um, Northampton Community College, and we're the community media center for the, for the city of Northampton. Um, that means we're funded through a mechanism which um, is a negotiation between the city and the cable provider. In Northampton's case, there's only one cable provider, Comcast, right? And um, there's a federal law called the Telecommunications Act, and that allows us allows the city some rights in um, negotiating with that provider for the city's public right of way to generate private revenue. Okay, and there are um, most things that you would probably want to negotiate, or most people want to negotiate for, are unnegotiable. You can't ask for rates negotiation. You can't ask for program negotiations. You can't say we have Nets in uh, separate from all the other channels, or however you'd like to break it off. Uh, you can negotiate for funding for a community media center. So that's that's really our major funding mechanism. That's how we get over 95% of our funding uh, through that negotiation. The city is in that process right now, actually, to renew that negotiation. Meaning directly that Comcast is funding the city to fund the Northampton. So there's a percent so there's a percentage of the of what Comcast it's based on it's it's not general fund money, it's not it's money that comes um, that Comcast pays directly to whatever community media organization is to fund it. And it's essentially it's compensation for using that public right of way. So um, so 95% of NCTV's funding actually comes directly from Comcast. Well, if you think, it depends how you want to sort of frame it, yes, but I mean, ultimately it's coming from the citizens of Northampton, right? It's coming from television revenues, actually, which is um, which, which is a whole other policy uh, debate that's going to happen at the federal level. But we, like, those funds, you know, the city or the community media center or either does not get funds from internet revenues, even though it goes over the same lines, it's really the same kind of data. Um, there's really no difference today between internet data and television data. It's all basically carried over in the same form. Okay. So, um, and there are there are complicated arguments for that, um, which I'm happy to talk about if anyone ever wants to engage in that. Um, so, but that, that's sort of where we are. Um, so eight years ago, we started the organization as an independent organization. The concern with Comcast at that point was really that no one was going to utilize it. That was one of the large arguments. Um, the station is not being used now, um, which is, is what they said. Um, it won't be used in the future. Um, there was a lot of resistance. The city was able, through largely the force of the citizens group, to, um, to sign a good contract with Comcast and start the new version of NCTV. So here we are eight years later, and we are really proud to say we've built one of the best community media centers in the United States. And I think that we can demonstrate um, really good metrics to show you why that is. Um, it's you know it's probably advantageous for us to be able to build something from scratch. It was a lot of work, but we've had a lot of success doing it. Um, and I'll show you some of the things that we do. Um, generally, if you're not familiar with community media, what we do we have a studio and facility, and we have lots of equipment, and we train people in multimedia production. In a lot of ways, we don't really think about ourselves as a television station. We think of ourselves as a multimedia space, as a maker space, as an arts collective, as a place that empowers voices. Um, to express really anything that they're interested in, in expressing. So that could be artistically, that could be politically, that could be personally, um, that could be in terms of event coverage, like a soccer game or a lacrosse game. It um, also manifests in government transparency, right? So one of our missions is to cover all of the meetings that we can and provide as much public information. It's mandated in an MOU between NCTV and the city that we cover, for instance, city council and school committees. And we do cover other meetings past that or provide opportunities for that um, simply because that's doing a better job as far as we right? So, um, so these are all sort of things that we're involved in. Um, this is our annual report from 2014 that you're looking up here. This is on our website. Um, we're a fully transparent organization. Um, you can look up our budgets online. And you can look up our annual reports online. And, and these are just, I thought I would start with this, and then I would show you just some of our, some of the projects we do visually. But, um, these are key points really from, from the past year. We won our third consecutive award for best website in the United States for our, um, for our industry. The sort of, the group that gives those awards out is called the Alliance for Community Media. It's a national organization. Um, I served on their national board. I served on the regional board for that organization and the state chapter for that station. So we've had a lot of um, policy discussions uh, from NCTV nationally uh, about um, we also won more awards than any other organization last year um, in community. So we're very proud of that. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we underwent an ascertainment process um, to renegotiate that contract with Comcast. 
And in that ascertainment process, which is available online, um, it's a matter of public record, we had a couple of hours of people come up and talk about NCTV. And the desire to have, to sustain NCTV as a resource for the community, um, there was a number of different um, items that the public cited that they wanted, such as high definition programming, um, or high definition broadcast, um, an on TV program guide, a number of uh, different items that we may or may not get, the city may or may not get in that negotiation. But that ascertainment was um, the city's attorney, who they retained for that negotiation, mentioned that it was the best ascertainment hearing they'd ever seen. And this is someone who has negotiated the contracts for 20 plus years um, all across the state of Massachusetts. So Meaning that there was really um, vigorous community involvement to support you? Exactly. The public showed up, the public um, was speaking positively towards the organization and then wanted that support. Um, Al, also, yeah. I attended that meeting, yes. and it was wonderful. Rodney Kunev, yes. right, had mentioned about closed captioning. Yep. How are we doing with that? So closed captioning has been it's been a, it's been a, an issue for us, a challenge for us for our entire year existence. Um, all television programming and now internet programming actually uh, that's generated through through television licenses is required by the FCC to be closed captioned. We are not because we are under what's called an exemption clause. And the, and the exemption is because the hardship of the cost of closed captioning is too great for us to bear as an organization. We have to see too much. The percentage of our budget is enormous. So we've looked at technology solutions for a long time. Our solution currently, and Rodney did give a really eloquent um, testimony to this fact that you know, to paraphrase what he said was that not having the government meetings captioned was in a sense a violation of his human rights because he was not able to interact and access government equitably, right? So, uh, I mean, we agree with that assessment and we are striving to caption. Um, our first priority is that government programming. I think it's unrealistic for us to find any solution where we're captioning all of our programming currently. But in our terms of the government programming, we've made that a capital item in our request to contact. So the, so the city is negotiating with the cable provider, and they've asked us for a budget for what our needs are. And in that budget, we've included an item that is for caption. So should that, should that, you know, should the acquisition um, in terms of the negotiation go according to plan, then we should have funding to, you know, we projected over 10 years how much it's going to cost us to caption the city council. I believe it was city council and school. Yeah, because he mentioned that also, and he just talked to me last week about that. Yeah, and we, you know, we also file, like as an organization, I mentioned that we're very active nationally in the discussion, and as an organization, <coughs> we, have filed, uh, we have filed um, uh, on FCC dockets continuously about that, um, in terms of um, what kind of requirements the FCC has for, for ADA compliance, and so it's our belief as an organization that, you know, FCC should be mandating that funding be present for community media centers to do this work, um, no matter what. So we've tried to fight it that way as well. And, and, and so hopefully we will solve it locally. Most, a lot of community media centers do not caption, but it is a priority for us. And that's, that's sort of our approach right now. This is a little out of left field kind of question. Sure. I'm just wondering if there are other models that are similar where a private corporation is funding because of citizen payments, some kind of community service. Because I'm just wondering in terms of policy around the closed captioning, if there are other kind of precedents of you know, corporate entities needing to, in fact, step up around that kind of thing? So, I mean, frequently you'll see like PBS or our local affiliates will, will reach out to private corporations to do that closed captioning funding. And um, it's, it's, as I said, it's very expensive. And so you'll see large corporations put their names like PBS captioned by Ford Motor Company. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking more about the model that we have of how community television yeah. is set up yeah. by a Comcast. So under, financially undergirding a community service is a corporate entity. So it's a little, I'm just wondering if there are other models in communities that not, have been mandated by federal policy similar to this. No, not that I'm aware of. And that is a that is that's a discussion that the federal government raises from time to time in terms of captioning, and that's sort of what I reference in the FCC documents is that this discussion, you know, there should be we believe there should be, um, but there is not. I'm not aware of it. There may exist, but I'm not aware. Of it. Um, 
Uh, in terms of social media, uh, we've, we, we, have an, we have a really great social media presence. It's hard to believe more people engage us, frankly, online than they do on television. That's, that's, we're, we don't know that for sure, but we're pretty certain that that's true. Um, we have, currently, these numbers are a little bit off, but we have over 3,000 Facebook likes. Um, the reason I bring up that number is because it's more likes than Boston community media has, it's more than Cambridge community media has, than Portland, Oregon has, and San Francisco has. Wow. Manhattan has more than we do. Um, other communities in the area, typically like Amherst, Greenfield, Longmeadow, average about 500 to 800 likes on their page. So um, that that's just that I, I bring up to indicate our dedication towards using media across all platforms to reach people. Right? It's important for us to be reaching people wherever they are, and we do a pretty good job of doing that. Um, we average also about um, 1,600 plays of our videos a week online. And so that's not hits of videos, that's people actually going to our video and playing that video and initiating the play on their own. I probably count for about half of them. There you, <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm um, certain counselors who uh, definitely are a good amount of those clicks. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. So, um, Do you have um, kind of data exactly about which what videos are being looked at? That kind of thing? You know, we could pull it up. Um, it's not in this report, but we could pull up exactly the right the right down as far as Government. Yeah, I mean, you know, government government is a big sector of what we do, and um, that's true in most community media organizations. But we also have a very robust community outside of that as well, and it's um, you know two different demographics. Um, we have, um, and I'm not going to go through all this point by point, but uh, to give you an example of the kind of traffic at our organization, we have currently over 20 cameras in the organization, and on a typical weekend, they're all out. They're all out in the community being used or something, which is um, a very high number. A lot of communities have three or four cameras, and sometimes they're not out on weekends. Um, we have, we, we embrace really, and if, if you have familiarity with multimedia, um, this may, may or may not make sense to you, but we embrace really like the independent filmmaking workflow in terms of our um, how we've chosen to embrace technology. That means we purchase a lot of DSLRs, okay, which is an atypical camera for use in community media. We're one of the few organizations in the country. It's something um, we've spoken on at a number of times at conferences about utilizing these this types of cameras. And one of the benefits is they're very high quality. And also, if you're 16 or 17 years old and you're looking to get involved in filmmaking, you're, you typically are going to be a little bit turned off by some of the kind of cameras that are being used in community. We want to be a cool organization. It's part of like our identity, and it's part of, of getting the community interested in what we do. So, you know, from a management philosophy, we're always trying to select tools and opportunities for people that they're interested in utilizing. We're not passive in terms of our approach. We're not sort of like, here, we built it, why isn't anyone using it? We want to find out what kind of things people want to use, and then empower them to use them, and become experts in them. We need to, if we're not already, all right? So that has really, um, works very well for us, and that's why I think we have this really high, high, um, high usage by the public. Um, that includes ultra HD cameras. We're shooting in 4K, so you know. And you know, I mentioned that that before that the, some of the public was asking for HD broadcast. You know, we're not even broadcasting in HD. We're broadcasting in standard def. All of our online content is high definition, and some of it will be 4K soon. But we're still broadcasting in standard def. It's probably unlikely that we will be in HD after this contract negotiation, um, simply because we may not have the, the momentum to push HD through. There are only 10 organizations in the whole country that have HD broadcasts. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready for high def. I just want you to know. I understand. You know, we get that reaction from a lot of people in government, <laughs> actually. Um, the cameras we will be putting in here will be high def. So we will be redoing this room, as you mentioned. Um, we're in we're in back and forth, final back and forth with vendors right now on numbers, and you'll see robotic cameras being installed here. There'll be four robotic high definition cameras. Does that mean that people aren't going to be coming to our meetings anymore? In terms of camera operators, yeah. it means yeah, it does. I mean, you let people. Too bad, I love them. It's actually one of the reasons we were resistant to putting right. robotic cameras in because it was a good training ground for us right. for operation of that style of camera. But we don't do a tremendous amount of that style of work. Um, that's not the independent filmmaking workflow, and it's just sort of what it's sort of just what we become based on what people want. But who knows? Um, I'll miss those interactions. Then. There'll still be some people here; they just may be tweeting instead. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, some other things we've done, we installed last year five cameras in different rooms. There's a camera back here you can record meetings with. There's a camera in, um, in, the, in the Council on Aging. Uh, there's a camera in DPW. There's a camera at JFK for people to record their own. So there's a second, second hall and city hall, right? We also installed a camera at Valley Free Radio. So we're trying to take the content that's created there that we can broadcast and, and bring in that VFR um, organization into, into creating content that's both radio and video at the same time. Um, we we have a lot of collaborations in the community. One of them is Valley Gives this year. We shot, um, we followed Valley Gives around and became their producer for the Valley Gives Day um, and, and have a partnership working with them. Um, we've organized community forums in partnership with Hampshire Gazette, WHMP, um, hosted meetup groups. Um, are the, are, we're the first members of the Mass Production Coalition as a community media organization, which is for filmmakers across the state of Massachusetts. So we also get involved in conversations about, like, for instance, the film actually, which is the biggest um, So some of our other projects. This is our main website here, which was just redesigned. Um, we redesign it about every two years at least. It's about how old, how quickly websites age, really, we feel like. And so this is sort of our newest, near, our newest iteration. The top still needs a little work. Um, but I encourage you to check it out. Um, There's a lot of good content here. Um, you can sign up for membership, for classes, for newsletters, all through the web portal. Essentially, um, one of our other um, sort of management styles is we try to, well, we try to provide very high quality tools. We try to make the barrier to entry very low. You do not have to pay any money to be involved with us whatsoever at any point. We have recommended donations, um, which is just our way of saying, hey, if you'd like to support us. But if someone comes in the door and they feel like they can't afford to, to donate, we don't ask questions about that because we're really interested in being utilized. That's our big metric, being utilized. Okay. Um, oh, the one thing I did want to show you before. Um, yeah. While you're looking for, I can ask you about the, I haven't seen the new website. And mostly because I found when I'm looking for a specific meeting, going to the YouTube channel is the easiest way. Yeah. Is is the new website um, organized in a way where you can search for meetings? Hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was one of the goals. It's searchable, so okay. meetings are fully searchable on there, and there are sections for meetings as well broken down. Okay. So hopefully it's easier. And if you ever have like commentary about that or questions or frustrations, okay. Okay. definitely we're really open to criticism too. So like say, Al, like, what's up? Okay. Search how much it has to be better. Okay. And it's helpful. But um, yeah, that was one thing we we've gotten feedback on just searching videos on the site. Al, so, sorry. Do you mind if I just interject for just one yeah. moment? I just uploaded my first YouTube uh, video onto the site, city's website. Oh, yeah? From something that you had uploaded from NCTV, one of our city council meetings. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they will be plugged into the all of them. I would be like I attached did my to the first one today. No way. So, so like attached to the minutes will also be the video. The video. Whoa. Yeah. You're so, amazing. So you guys will be able to access any of the meetings that you're having, courtesy of NCTV, yeah. uploading them to YouTube. That's awesome. So there you go. Um, the, num the number I wanted to show you, this is really our, um, I talked about our metric, and this is the most beautifully format, formatted table here, but um, I mentioned that our metric is being utilized, and that is really how we measure our, like, what we're doing. If, if we feel like our facility is empty or equipment's lying around, then maybe we make poor choices about like how we're engaging people, right? So this is a representation of days of producer equipment used from 2008 through 2014. And a day of equipment uh, used can mean uh, a number of different things, and, we, and if you are really interested in how we determine it, there's a paragraph here that, will, that discusses that for you. And it has to do with, um, so if someone checks a camera out for a weekend, that's one day. One checkout is one day. Okay, so it's like one instance of use. So you see in 2008, we had 155 days or instances of using, interacting with the facility. And last year, we've had, you can see that number ramping up, ramping up to 2,520 last year. So we've seen a tremendous amount of growth over that period of time. Um, it's, you know, we're very, very pleased with, with, that, with that number. And frankly, it's a little low. If you read the metric, 
we like to be conservative in our estimates. So like there's a whole slew of interns we have. We average about a dozen interns every semester. And that includes people from all five college systems. That includes people from Springfield. That includes, we had two kids from Vermont who came and interned with us over J term or winter term for a one month intensive because they heard we were such a great community media facility for producing original content, okay? And I'll show you a little bit about that in a bit. So, so we have like good reputation, and we have um, we've generated a lot of, of traffic. Um, we have three kids who are graduating from the high school this year who basically did almost all of their work utilizing us. They're all going to Emerson next year. One of them was accepted to NYU Film School and declined, which is really rare. But it's really, really hard to get into NYU Film School. And I'm going to show you actually one of his trailers on that for some of his work. Okay, so that's sort of we're really proud of that metric as well. Um, so this is our main website. Another project we have, so we have a couple of different projects we run as an organization. This is Paradise City Press. So this is our citizen journalism and community storytelling initiative. We launched this about two years ago. And the idea behind this is that there are a lot of, um, a lot of news agencies that are sort of going away. Um, it's actually not as true in this area. We have a lot of vibrant news organizations. We still have a daily paper. There's a local AM news radio show. Um, there are a lot of like pretty, you know, of organizations still hanging on, that are, and it's not necessarily true throughout the country. So this allows for um, people to submit content to Paradise City Press as citizen journalism, uh, citizen journalists or community storytellers. Okay. So one of the differences between this content is it doesn't have to be video. It can be print on web. It can be photographs. It can be um, audio in the form of a podcast or just in the form of raw audio supporting other materials. And any combination of those things um, can can appear in the citizen journalism project. Is there any editing or fact-checking fact that goes with it? So our vetting process is like not as heavy as we would like, but we look for flags. And if we have anything that sounds like it's like there's a question about it in terms of it's an opinion, we put it under an opinion column. Mm -hmm. um, if we have anything that's suspicious, we do have a staff member who you know gets put into a queue, they read through it, and if there are flags, then then we go back. Um, and there's disclaimers in here as well. But it, I mean, it's a question everyone asks. Um, you know, news organizations, newspapers aren't vetting like they used to. Yeah. There used to be rules about two sources, and, and most people don't even check sources anymore, I need to say. But um, this is an experiment for us. We also like to do, take a lot of sort of uh, low, uh, a lot of risks that are low cost. And so this is a low cost risk that we started. Um, we got a grant this year um, in collaboration with Amherst Media and Greenfield Community Television to pay stringers to produce stories on this site which we did, and we actually have budgets we're going to be paying stringers for the rest of the year. It's a limited budget, um, but we are sort of, it's just a way for us to play and interact with what kind of models will support a citizen journalism program, right? Because, um, you know, it takes a while just to get people used to there being this content, and we have to have regular content for people, for it to be valuable to people. So we're always sort of revisioning re what this means as well for us, but we, we're really happy with the content, like if you look on it, Today or in the last couple of months, we're pretty happy with what's been going on. It has its own Facebook page. It's got about 600 likes on its Facebook page. Um, it's, um, we shared stories with the Hampshire Gazette off of this, uh, back and forth. We shared content um, with NEPR. I think we shared a little bit of content with NEPR off of this as well. Um, and it's also, you know. This also involves a broader scope of people who may not be as interested in video production, but may be interested in media production. And so again, envisioning ourselves as a, as a comprehensive media organization as opposed to a TV station. Um, this is an, an, an offshoot of that. And all of the skills that we teach here are applicable to television production as well. Um, another one of our projects is called the Seven Day Film Sprint. This started last year. Uh, that's returning to 2015. Um, this is a week-long original um, narrative film. Um, it's not really a competition. I guess it's a little bit of a competition. But we have what we did is we reach out to the community. Um, you know, as we as I mentioned, we sort of had this with support this independent filmmaking workflow. That means that more than other community media organizations, we've connected with a lot of people who are doing original creative content meaning like original narrative stories. Um, and that includes people who are professional or interested in being professional filmmakers. Um, 
So because that community, which over the years has grown and grown in relationship to us, um, existed, we decided to have this seven-day film screen. It was an idea of one of our community members, Alex Russo, and it was really successful. We had 14 teams from the community, which is about 100 people participate. And we had 14 student teams in the high school also participate. So we had 28 films made. And there's seven, up to seven minute films. They had a week to make them. People like walked up. We had a ceremony in our studio where they walked up and they would draw a genre out of a hat. So it was inspirational sports movie. Or it was um, Lifetime uh, movie, like Lifetime Channel movie. Or it was horror film or monster film or like, all these different genres that we had brainstormed. And that was really the only guidance that people had. It's very similar to like the 48 hour film festival or 24 hour theater festival. Um, but it was a really great event for us. Um, and to the extent that there was so much clamor for it that people asked us to have it in the summer, which we are not doing, we're having a different event, which I won't talk about because we're going to announce it at our film screening, which is another project that we started a couple of years ago called Cinema Northampton. Okay, so you may have heard of Cinema Northampton, you may not have. Oh, whoops, I just. Did that happen? I don't know if I have to. So, um, Cinema Northampton, and I don't know why the site didn't come up when I looked for it. The, uh, cities. the city's Wi-Fi? Yeah, yeah. Here, right here, not Public Wi-Fi. Sometimes this works. Yeah. Oh, it's going to ask me. Yeah, it takes a second to pop up. Any questions so far? That's what I'm talking about. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Cool. Um, well, while I load, I can tell you a little bit about the story of it. <coughs> and it's uh, starting about three you know, years if, ago. If you go to like um, Google uh, Maps, it'll pop up. Like it's going to pop up. I'm going to force prompt it. We started this about three years ago um, and screened two films for the public for free, um, Princess Bride and Ghostbusters. And then two years ago, or last year, uh, Forbes Library became a partner on the Cinema Northampton project. And we started showing them at Forbes Log. We showed two films last year, Back to the Future and... Uh, what's the second one? E.T. And this year, we've, the partnership is NCTV and Forbes Library Arts Council, the Park and Rec, and the Academy Music. And it's turned into what's going to be a year-round event to do free film screenings for the public outside during the warm months and um, inside the Academy during the cold months. And the idea here is like, it's, an, it's really, a, it's, it's in terms of our budget, it comes out of marketing because we're able to go out to the community. Like, you know, one of the service we provide is we build a community. Part, as part of what we do. And so having like a film screening to bring people to is a way of building community around the kind of work that we have. It looks like it's going to be at different venues, right? So Forbes Library, for example, on May 27th. There's one at Maine's Field. Yeah, because Park and Rec wanted to, they just yeah. redid Maine's Field and they the wanted to. The Goonies. Right. So people will be going to Maine's Field for that one. Then the rest of the outdoors ones will be at Forbes. Okay. It's Raiders of the Lost Ark at the end of May. It's our kickoff event. It's actually on the city's website too, so. Right. Sure, it's because it's, some of these are, there's a lot of public private government partnership going on here, right? Mm -hmm. 
the Academy of Music in November right. and December. So. Mr. LeGras is going to be selling sandwiches and popcorn there at the event. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it's growing, and it's a, it's a place where we talk about what we do as well. So we'll talk about NCTV and the programs we have before it. Um, so it's educational, um, and it also just provides this, this really nice event. So we're announcing <laughs> that was a so we're going to be announcing our summer project at that Raiders of the Lost Ark screen there. So you can, you can check that out. Um, so now if you're not online, So you won't really get a great, my, the audio on my computer is um, terrible, but...
So that's our 2014 highlight reel. So a lot of work gets done, a lot of different kinds of things. Actually, yeah, I'll show you one more thing. Yeah, that's okay. Leave them off. But I can I can put those back on. Um, I'll show you this. This is a trailer. This is one of our sort of. We have a lot of great stories to do. Everything. This is just a trailer. I'll show you real yeah. quick. Uh, Sort of, we buy resources and we pay staff and we have electricity and we do all this so the content gets created by people. So maybe we should have a program where we just give people money to create content, right? That's sort of how the conversation can happen in our head. What would that look like? If that was our model. So we started a production grants program, um, which we did this year as well. We gave about $6,000 in three grants of $2,000 a piece. This was the youth grant. So we gave $2,000 for a narrative film, $2,000 for a documentary film, and $2,000 to a youth filmmaker who could do whatever they wanted. And this was uh, Ben Bradley Gilbert, um, who got that grant, 16 years old, and he, he wrote a he wrote a 100-page screenplay to submit to us as part of that grant. And we gave him the grant, and it's a tragedy and comedy, the whole story, but um, this is what he produced. You ask where he produced it, and it's a really good question because it's really hard to get a prison to shoot it. And um, we tried really, really hard, and we ended up interfacing with the Mass Film Commission, who works with Hollywood films in order to book, to book spaces. And they were a, working with them, they gave Ben for free a week a large prison out in Great Barrington in which to shoot his film. Okay. And, uh, and they were ecstatic to do that, to support young filmmakers now. He was making the street his like, short, first short film, right? And what an exciting story for him to be able to interface with the, Ma with the Mass Film Commission to work in this prison that a lot of Hollywood films, there have been a couple of Hollywood films shot in this prison. He also worked with SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild of New England, because we had, there was a um, union actor who, who auditioned for the film and weren't sure like, how to even pay him, how not, whether or not he could be paid because Ben's a, a minor and can't sign a contract. You know, like it was very complicated. And it, you know, during that process, I asked these questions like, how do I direct adults? How do I direct my friends? Like, how are they going to be, how will they listen to me as a person as opposed to one of their friends? Like, what kind of process do I take in doing that? And those are all experiences that he had to work through. Um, what happened is, there's about only about 20 minutes of this film in existence because his hard drive crashed. Yeah. He's, they, they, like, all producers are supposed to use, we have a very, very secure hard drive system that we've invested in, which is very hard to crash. If you lose a hard drive, it doesn't affect it. It's called a RAID array, which means it's a series of hard drives. It's 42 terabytes big. It has all this redundant production. If you lose a hard drive, nothing happens. You just replace it and it rebuilds itself. Well, he had been moving his footage back and forth so frequently and gotten off the habit of keeping it on our drives, and he lost it on his hard drive, which is also a lesson that almost every filmmaker makes. <laughs> Mistake everyone makes. It's not bad to learn it at 16. Right? It's better to learn it at 16. <laughs> and um, and so we most of the film was lost because and it was supposed to be like a five or ten minute film. He shot an hour film really is what he was working with. Um, 
And so he's got about 20 minutes of it in existence. So that's the sad part. But the great part is it's not really, like we have some of the footage, you can see this trailer, the trailer is good, but it's also that experience that we need is invaluable, right? Just to be treated like an adult, to be to go through that and be given a project to have someone believe in him, and it's really, he's, it's helped him shine as a person. So we're really happy with it, even though it's a disaster, sort of, in one sense, but it's also a huge success in another. And so we like that story, because we like both of those um, So that's kind of an example of other stuff, right, that we're doing too. So we can bring out those words as well. Um, Learned a lot today. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I mean, there are other, we do work with schools. Jeremy Whalen is the new video teacher in the high school. We've had a video program in this school for a while. I actually am realizing that this is fine as well. But, you know, this perspective series is something that, that um, this is another thing like that. So I actually don't really want to show it because it's, it's his work again. And, um, but, but Jeremy Whalen is working in the high school now. He used to be an employee at Martin now works in the high school, and we have a really, really strong relationship. Um, he understands um, sort of how we work. I think in past years, the high school didn't necessarily have someone whose his specialty was video production that was teaching video. We had, there was somebody who taught video and worked very hard, but um, but it wasn't their primary skill set, which happens in a lot of high schools. I think Jeremy is a filmmaker, and he's like been working very, very well. It's been a fantastic relationship. And you see the quality of content that's coming out of the high school now, because we are in the high school. Fantastic, and we're getting more and more and more use out of that all the time. So, um, so that's great. Really cool. um, I think that's most of it. That's kind of who we are. What we do, we do we have our hands on a lot of things. A lot. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're very, very, very busy. Um, you should come and check out our space. We're looking in future years to expand because we have we we've outgrown our space, so we anticipate. Hopefully, we'll still be in the high school. Um, we'll begin to renew that lease. It's up in a couple of years, but we would like to be there. And then we're looking, we've already been looking at satellite locations around the city to have a presence that's a little bit, um, it can be difficult to access the high school sometimes from the general public because the parking is difficult and we're all the way around the building. If you've ever been to our facility, it's hard to find. So there's some, so we'll benefit us a lot because we need space to have a satellite location and that's what we're looking at now. How, how big of an area do you need? It's a question that can vary a lot for us. So we've looked at spaces like 1,200 square feet, but we can fill like three or 4,000 square feet as well. And you know, we would like it accessible to public transportation would be good. If they had good street visibility, which is of course cost a fortune in Northampton, but that would be really great. So we've looked at Arts Trust building or a conversation with them, that would be a good natural fit we think for that, for that space, because there's a lot of arts going on there as well. And um, you know, for future projects, we look, Towards, towards building out that the nature space aspect of what we do too. So if there are, there's other technology we can bring in and bring community resources, um, we like to do that. We really think of ourselves as a community space, like a public park, or like that's why we allow people to meet in our space because we don't own the space, the community owns that space. It's not ours, it's just, it, and public space is at a premium, frankly. It's not It's not everywhere. And so that's, that's the rent is so expensive. Yeah. We like to be, we like to be, again, because we like to be utilized, because we're public space, this is what we do. We like to like curate discussion and opportunity. Question? Um, you mentioned that you mentioned it before. What do you think about the, the film tax credit? I think that, I think the state should retain the film tax credit. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I, the narrative of the state is that there are numbers that show that a lot of money is not being spent locally as much as you would think it's being sent back to Hollywood or wherever. But I think that there are, you know, the externalities of the money being spent, like, is is a lot broader than that study shows, if that's true. And and I would say I don't have a lot of stake in that because none of that money funds us right. or anything like that. But I do believe that film commit, the, the film, like the mass production film. That's, that's correct. I think the film credits are a good thing. And, I mean, that industry will leave if that tax credit is not retained. It will. It will okay. leave. Yeah. They'll, I mean, they'll find locations elsewhere. They'll definitely go find locations elsewhere. Because you could just look at what kind of production happened in North, like in Massachusetts. Good. Since that film tax credit has been, it's totally changed the way Massachusetts looks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
we've had conversations of Massachusetts being Hollywood East, right? They were trying to build a huge film studio in Eastern Mass at one point because they thought, you know, they could do it. And they couldn't pull off the funding because it was an enormous, enormous amount of money. It was kind of ridiculous. But, but I, I do personally think that they should do the tax credit, just as a person. That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. How many staff do you have? We have four staff. That's it? Four full time employees. Thank you for saying that, Sid. Yes. Some people think that's a lot. It's to do what we do. I don't think that's a lot. Yeah. We I've have been a, in there and I see how busy they are. We're super, and you know, we try to treat, we staff are, they're not making a fortune working there. We're a nonprofit organization, but we try to make it a fun place to work and we try to treat staff really well and be respectful of them their time and like their mental health and make that a benefit of working there, you know, because to incentivize them to do good work and it makes them, it doesn't make them because it's a strictly strong word, but it helps them to work very hard. I think. The staff really believes in the organization, which means that they're like, they have ownership in it and it produces really high quality results. I remember at one point, we used to have a lot of guys in girls that would come in with the cameras. Yes. Now I'm seeing it with the In terms of the number of like interns, yeah, it's not it's not as many. We bring as many people as we need to, to do it, to pull it off. We only need to have one camera right? It's only, you don't need a tremendous amount of staff to pull off the, sh the shoot that happens in here. And so, you know, I think most of those interns who we have are usually doing other things. And a couple people will like, be very interested in this aspect of the work. Um, and you will see less, right? So there's a lot of camera. Do you know if they're ever going to do the electrical work? Because I know Bill Dwight had talked about it last year. We would come in, and even at city council meetings, you just turn the switch on, and they're operable. Well, so that's, so that's what the robotic cameras will be, right? So you'll just, and you'll still need an operator for those cameras but there you will need fewer people to, to produce those meetings because someone will control all of those meetings remotely from that same room. But that whole room will be redone and this room, you'll see cameras, you'll also see screens in this room because there's a desire to move away from, from this as the, as the only display. And so we're actually looking, currently the plan is for three screens in here. So you will see reference screens for city council, two for city council, or whoever meets in here. I say yeah. city council because yeah. that's like this full room, right? And then you'll see a display for the public as well. Hmm. So that you can just, and there will be a system so that you can remotely push your screen onto those screens. So you won't need this at all. You'll sit down with the laptop and you'll you'll push to an IP address and you propagate your content to the screens. And that's it. And so <coughs> you can access, you can throw content at remotely just by being on the same yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm sure. I'm sure. It's, this room has long needed a, a facelift. Yeah. Yeah. So we're. Can you get us new chairs too? No, I can't. <laughs> I would like new shades. You know, yeah, new shades. That would be my first time. You know, piece of infrastructure. I would change this room. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. If you have any questions, be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the weather. Thanks. Appreciate it all. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Aye.